welcome Age of Vintage Society. Gorgeous K. Francis is truly one of the shining gems of the pre-code era, able to project both a sense of lavish sophistication as well as an impish side. She flourished in the permissibility and for a short time became one of the most famous and highest paid actresses in the world. How K. Francis made a career by lying to the right people. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Kay Francis is one of my favourite actresses, but after her career imploded in the late 1930s, her reputation never recovered. Today her movies are underseen and she's barely remembered, except as a footnote in Lubitsch's filmography. I thought I would put together some of the Kay's life events, so that if you're interested in exploring her work, you will have a place to start. Kay Francis came of age in the Roaring Twenties and relished the era's hedonistic pursuits. Her career as an actress was launched at the same time, and before her death in 1968, she had appeared on many theatre stages, in more than 60 films, on radio, in USO tours, as a model, and on television. The tall, stylish actress had a husky voice and dark beauty that was striking on film. Despite her financial success, relaxed morals, and life as a socialite, the millionaire actress shunned luxuries such as limousines and sprawling estates popular among Hollywood elite. The actress, who insisted she wanted to be forgotten, left behind scrapbooks, boxes of memorabilia, and detailed diaries. These rich resources helped provide an exhaustive look at the life of one of Hollywood's most intriguing early stars. One of the most glamorous stars of the 1930s, Kay Francis, spent much of her screen time dressed to the nines in a series of the latest fashions. An imposing five foot nine inches tall, she received her start on stage and then graduated into the movie industry as a contract player at first, Paramount Pictures and then Warner Brothers. Despite a mild speech impediment, she swiftly became one of Hollywood's premier leading ladies, thanks to successes like One Way Passage, Trouble in Paradise, Mandalay, and I Found Stella Parrish, and was the country's highest paid actress in 1936. No one's idea of a wallflower, Francis relished the wildlife going through several husbands and numerous lovers, which resulted in a number of unwanted pregnancies. At the height of her fame, a falling out with Warner resulted in fewer prestige assignments for Francis, and her popularity diminished. Once free from their dictates, she worked for various studios and devoted much of her free time to USO tours and entertaining American troops overseas. However, by the mid-1940s, film employment had dried up and fans would only be able to catch her in a handful of stage and television productions during the years that followed. A larger-than-life personality both on and off screen, Francis was mostly forgotten in later years but both the actress's life and acting career were too rich and intriguing for her to languish in such undeserved obscurity. She was the lankiest female star of Hollywood's golden age, with an impeccable sense of style. The critics called her a clothes horse. With large, expressive hazel eyes and dramatic dark hair, she was never an ingenue, playing sophisticated society women, sharp business women, and scheming villainesses while barely out of her teens. Her somewhat husky voice lacked the almost British mid-Atlantic accent used by many actresses in similar roles. But a slight speech defect, a lisp which made her letter R and L sound like W, actually seemed to audiences to be upper class. The voice, the height, the sense of style made her a definitively modern American leading lady, seldom assigned to play Brits or to costume dramas and one who had astonishingly few love scenes with her leading men, some of whom she towered above. Yet for a good stretch of the 1930s, Kay Francis was one of the most popular female stars in Hollywood. She was the queen of Warner Brothers, until Jack Warner soured on her, and Betty Davis knocked the crown from her head. Catherine Edwina Gibbs was born in Oklahoma City in 1905. Her father was six foot five inches tall, a wealthy businessman who abandoned the family before she was four years old. Her Nova Scotia-born mother, Catherine Clinton, was an actress who returned to the stage to support her daughter. The girl usually accompanied her mother, 
That early exposure may have intrigued her about the possibilities of such a life, but it would be some time before she decided to pursue show business. But when her mother could afford it, she was sent to Catholic schools and even briefly to an upstate New York finishing school. When she was 15, she enrolled in the Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School in New York City, the flagship of a then successful and famous chain of business schools for young ladies. When she graduated, she skipped the steno pool or even service as a private secretary. Instead, the sophisticated teenager got highly respectable and well-paying positions selling real estate and arranging extravagant parties for wealthy socialites. In this capacity, she met James Dwight Francis, a son of a wealthy New England family. They wed when she was just 17. The marriage was short-lived. In something that might have come straight out of the script from one of her later movies, Catherine sailed to Paris to obtain a divorce with a minimum of scandal. While there, she met former Harvard athlete and Boston William Gaston, who swept her off her feet. She later admitted to advancing her early career by lying a lot to the right people. Some suspect that this turn of phrase was a pun on laying a lot. One of those she impressed by word or deed was producer Stuart Walker, who hired her for his touring repertoire Portmanteau Theatre Company. Making the rounds of Midwest cities in roles ranging from walk-ons to features, she quickly learned her craft. Kay seed to the stage herself by the mid-twenties, and landed a spot on Broadway. Walter Houston, her co-star in a play called Elmer the Great, was so entranced with her work that he encouraged her to give motion pictures a shot. Understandably, her long-distance marriage to Gaston ended in divorce about this time, but Francis never seemed to be short of wealthy suitors. Next in line was playboy Alan Ryan Jr. Before their brief marriage, she promised his family that she would give up the stage. That proved to be a promise she could not keep. In 1928, she found her greatest success to date as the female lead in Ring Lardner's baseball comedy Elmer the Great, opposite Walter Houston, and produced by George M. Cohen. Cohen helped her obtain a screen test at Paramount Pictures Studio in Astoria, Queens. She was cast in Gentlemen of the Press, once again opposite Houston, a star turn in her first film. Nonetheless, Paramount was impressed enough by these two outings, both released in 1929, to offer Frances a lucrative contract and invite her to work at the main studio in California. Not yet 25 years old, she was a movie star. Shortly before leaving New York, Frances married for the fourth time to writer-director John Meehan. Once again, a long-distance relationship failed, especially after Frances took up with actor and producer Kenneth McKenna, who she married in 1931. That marriage failed two years later. Frances laid off matrimony for a while, having affairs with various men, including some co-stars and occasionally with women. The studio certainly kept her busy, churning out more than 21 films featuring or starring her in before the end of 1931. Her first California-made film, Dangerous Curves, a circus drama in which Frances, billed as Kay for the first time, is the vamp who tries to steal the pretty boy acrobat from the virtuous but plain girl who truly loves him. Interestingly, the plain Jane was Clara Bow, the sexiest of silent stars in one of the films that killed her career, but it cemented Frances as the evil other woman, a part she would play with variations over and over again. Frances was often the second lead alternating between the temptress and the wronged woman. Despite her success there, Paramount was a studio in trouble. It had had a glut of actresses and had a run of bad luck and bad pictures. The studio was in financial trouble. In what would be recognised by any sports fan as a salary dump, at the end of 1932 it released Francis, Powell and Ruth Chatterton to Warner Brothers, where all got big raises and promises of better roles. In the short run it was a hell of a career move for Francis. Warner's was then the second biggest and most successful studio in Hollywood, behind Bear Moth MGM. It was feasting on a string of successful musicals and the tough, gritty urban dramas and crime stories for which it became famous. It was well stocked with wise-cracking dames fit for those pictures, but needed a more elegant leading lady for films set among the posh for the diversion of depression-weary audiences. Kay Francis was the key to winning that audience and the devotees of women's movies. 
sudsy melodramas of marriage and betrayal in penthouse apartments, Park Avenue mansions and country estates with lots of changes of elegant wardrobe. In addition to a salary, Warner's boosted Frances's career by giving her more sympathetic roles, top billing with its biggest male stars including Powell, better scripts and lavish production values. It worked spectacularly. By 1935, Frances was taking down $150,000 a year, or about $4,000 a week. By contrast, Betty Davis, Warner's fast rising star, was making only $18,000. And don't think Davis didn't notice. The same year she was the top grossing female star and the sixth biggest money maker among all the stars. She appeared on 38 national magazine covers more than any other adult Hollywood actress and second only to the astonishing 138 covers featuring the adorable Shirley Temple in the seven year span from 1930 to 37. Kay Francis was as hot a commodity as there was. Gone for the most part were the temptresses, villains and husband stealers she had specialised in at Paramount. But good parts were all too rare, and when the plots to her weepers grew ever more convoluted and ridiculous, Frances rebelled. She watched the spunky Bette Davis challenge Jack Warner for better parts and get them despite high drama and suspensions. When she tried the same thing, the dictatorial Warner was not amused. He seemed to throw her a bone, one of Warner's prestigious biopics produced as Oscar bait. Francis was cast as Florence Flo Nightingale in 1936's White Angel. The expensive costume drama was a box office bust. That turned Warner firmly against his leading lady. He began to extract revenge, even if it was nearly as costly to the studio as it was to Francis's career. It began subtly. Francis's lisp had never been a problem or mentioned in the press. Warner Studio Flax began feeding gossip columnists and fan magazines supposed quotes from fellow cast and crew members mocking her impediment. One joke went that behind her back they called her the Wavishing K. Francis. Then the script writers on her movies were instructed to load her dialogue up with as many words as possible with R's and L's, preferably strung together for greater effect. The transition from silent cinema to talkies brought about the end of several major careers. Despite a slight speech impediment that caused her to pronounce R with a W sound and led to occasional jokes at her expense, Frances was able to maintain and grow her stardom. As was common for contract players of the time, the studio kept their crowd pleaser busy, but Frances still managed to raise considerable hell in her personal life. Instead of improving, her scripts kept getting even more ludicrous. Finally, Frances announced that she would sue the studio to force them to give her better parts. That really enraged Jack Warner, who vowed to destroy her career. The studio sent out a press release announcing that Frances was being demoted to pictures from the B unit, which churned out low-budget programmers for the bottom half of double bills. It was not unusual for a studio to demote ageing or fading stars in this way, or even to temporarily punish top stars like Bette Davis. But it was unheard of to make a public announcement of the humiliation. Frances was toiling at a studio that was actively trying to destroy her career. She bitterly noted in her private journal that she would show up and scrub floors rather than give up and quit, as Warners hoped she would, to keep her $4,000 a week salary. She also despairingly suggested that when her film career was finally over, all of her films and their negatives would be burned so that the world would forget she ever existed. In the midst of all the turmoil, Frances married for the fifth and final time to a guy named Eric Barncow, about whom almost nothing is known and who quickly vanished from her life. Frances discovered that no other studio would pick her up. She was forced into the role of an independent actor, available for work on a picture-by-picture -picture basis for any studio that would hire her, at far less than she made at Warner's. Old friends rallied to her support. When America entered World War II, Frances virtually put her career aside to dedicate herself to war work. She organised one of the first tours of American performers to entertain Army Air Force crews in England and troops in North Africa. This was before the USO was even organised, 
and Frances had to make virtually all of the arrangements for her small troop herself. But peace came and there were no offers. After being turned down everywhere, Frances swallowed her pride and inked a deal to produce and star in her own pictures for Monogram Pictures, one of the poorest of the Poverty Row studios. That was the end of Kay Frances's movie career. She returned to the stage and had some success with regional touring companies and summer stock. In 1948, she was badly injured and scarred in a freak radiator accident. After that, she did some radio and made two television appearances in 1950 and 51, both long lost. She became something of a recluse, spending most of her time in virtual seclusion in her New York apartment and her estate near Falmouth on Cape Cod. She had no children or living relatives. In 1966, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and died despite undergoing a mastectomy on August 28, 1966 in New York. As requested, her remains were cremated and scattered at an undisclosed location. In the end, she was nearly as obscure and forgotten as she once claimed that she wanted to be. She left her estate, valued at well over a million dollars, to her favourite charity, Guide Dogs for the Blind. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Kay Francis?